Hey everyone, I'm so glad you're here this morning for more in our series, Go Back to the Beginning and our time in Genesis. One song we've been singing is a song that proclaims that truth out of Hebrews, that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. I love that reality, that God and Jesus being God are the same and consistent in all we're taking in from Genesis and even leading up to today and all the changing circumstances and experiences we're coming in with. In midst of all that, we gather together to worship God, the constant through it all. And what an incredible truth that is, that while the things around us may be uncertain and shift and disrupt things, even so, God is faithful and constant and sure. He's been the same in the past, he'll be the same today, and he's going to be the same forever. That's who he is and who he always will be. What a sure foundation for us in every season, in every circumstance. Love that you're here, love that we get to worship God together this morning, and love what he continues to do among us. Let's head over, and then I will see you all in just a bit. Good morning, Christ Chapel. My name's Cameron. I'm a part of our women's ministry team. Thanks so much for joining us today for worship. If this is your first time with us, welcome. There is a connect card on the seat back in front of you. If you wanna fill that out, that gives us a chance to tell you who we are as a Christ Chapel family and how you can get connected. And no matter who you are, we want to join you in prayer, whatever you're praying for, big or small. There's also a prayer card on the seat back in front of you. You can fill that out and drop those in the white box outside the sanctuary. And if you're joining us online, there's a link to both of those in the chat. Well, Easter is right around the corner and there's a couple things I wanna put on your radar for that. The first is Easter lilies. This is the tradition we have here at Christ Chapel. If you would like to dedicate a lily in memory or in honor of a loved one, you can do that and find out more about that on our website. The second is our Good Friday service or Tenebrae. This is our time to reflect on the sacrifice of Christ on the cross. We would love to have you join us for that on March 29th. And you can get your reservation reminder also online. And then about reservation reminders in general, Easter weekend is a wonderful weekend here at Christ Chapel, and we want to be sure we have a seat for you and for whoever you want to bring. So if you will be sure to grab your reservation reminders online, that lets us be sure we have a place for every single person. And we also have inviter cards out in the great room. We would invite you to pray about who the Lord might have you bring and invite to Easter to celebrate the resurrection of Christ with us. Well, as we begin our time of worship, we like to begin by saying hello to one another. Would you stand and greet those around you? Good morning, Christ Chapel. I invite you to worship with us as we celebrate our King. We're gonna sing a song, and this is the gospel that Jesus is our hope. We have a hope that we can look forward to because he's coming back again. Let's sing together. to 
celebrate the truth that our God holds the whole universe in his hands, that he holds the future. The mystery of what lies ahead of us is not a mystery to him. And this morning we can sing to him in confidence. And last week we taught a new song called Same God that personally for me and for my wife and our family has just meant a ton. You know, we each walk in carrying different stories, different journeys different experiences. And there are moments in life that are so, so painful, so hard, so uncertain. And we cry out to the Lord because who else can we cry out? If our help doesn't come from the Lord, who does it come from? And in these moments of faith and desperation, we cry out to a God who has been the same God, consistent, faithful, and true through generation after generation, who before you took your first breath knew you by name, knew you head to toe. And so this morning as we sing this song, maybe you're singing this song from a mountaintop high, from a moment where you can confidently sing, God, I know that you're good, that you have cared for me. Or maybe you're coming in and today that is a cry of desperation. It is a cry of faith, God, I need you. I need to believe that you still move. Church, don't miss out on the opportunity to do business with God to meet with him. Let's sing this together in faith.
whose love endures through generations. I know that you will keep your covenant. I'm calling on the God of Moses, the one who opened up the ocean. I need you now to do same thing for me, for me, for me. And oh God, my God, I need you. Oh God, my God, I need you now. How I need you now. Oh rock, oh rock of ages, I'm standing on your faithfulness I'm calling on the God of prayer whose favor rests upon the Lord I know with you all things are possible Shepherd boy, courageous. I may not face Goliath, but I've got my own giant. Oh God, my God, I need you. Oh God, my God, I need you now. How I need you now. Oh rock, oh rock of ages, I'm standing. your children you hear your children you are the same God you are the same God you answered prayers by and you will answer you are the same let's cry out in faith you are the same God you were provided you are providing, you are the same, you are the same, you moved in power, God moved in power now, you are the same God, you are the same God, you were a healer and God you
Father, how can we not sing and boast of your goodness? We're so undeserving of the opportunity to sit at your table, to cry out to you, to call out to you, and for you to hear us, for you to move. But what a gift and privilege it is to sing to you, to know that we're sons and daughters because of the price that your son paid. Father, may we never forget where our help comes from. May our eyes be fixed on you. In the mystery and the uncertainty of all that life has, we can be certain and confident of you. That you hold our future and you're coming back again. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Church, you can be seated. Church, let's continue worshiping through our giving. You have three opportunities or three ways of giving. You could do it online, in person, by dropping off your offertory in the offertory boxes just outside in the great room at the end of the service, or you can text to the number on the screen. If you're a guest here today, we don't expect you to give. We're just thankful that you are here with us. Giving is something that we do as a church. As you all know, we, this generation, this culture is doing everything possible to get our kids and kind of steer them away from God and having an opportunity to be transformed by him. About 400 of y'all throughout all campuses weekly serve and minister to about 1,200 kids, sharing the gospel to them, giving them the opportunity to know who he is. And as a church, our goal is to partner with our parents and help our parents point their kids to Jesus Christ. Your generosity has given the opportunity for us to also minister to our community. And in doing so, we do that through Kids Camp. And about 400 children get the opportunity to hear the gospel and be transformed by Jesus Christ. I wanna thank you, church, for allowing this to occur registration opens today. Let's go ahead before the Lord in prayer. Thank you, God, that as a church, you allow us to give, to build your kingdom, Lord, for the next generation, not just ours, Lord. As we, Father, take it serious in bringing the gospel of Jesus Christ to the little ones, Lord, that you never denied. We thank you for the opportunity. I thank you for this church and for their giving and generosity. In Jesus' name, amen. Les amants de Paris couchent sur ma chanson la, 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 la. Les refrains que je leur dis, c'est plus beau que les beaux jours. Ça fait des tas de printemps et le printemps, c'est l'amour. À Paris, les amants s'aiment dans leur façon. Donnez-moi des chansons. Qu'on s'aime à Paris. Well, hello, Christ Chapel, and happy March Madness to all of you. We are in uh, March, which is a wonderful uh, time to watch some college basketball. That, uh, ha that tournament hasn't started yet, but uh, being March, uh, Easter is at the end of this month. And so I just want to reiterate what you probably heard at the beginning of all the services about uh, Easter. We certainly want you to invite uh, your friends, neighbors, coworkers, anyone. Guys, eight out of 10 people that you ask or invite to Easter will say, yes, 
Uh, now that them saying yes isn't dependent upon you. Uh, all that God has called us to do is to be faithful to invite. And so just be faithful and invite. And then also as you are looking at the different services, uh, would you please consider going to one of those outside hours? Uh, one of those opportunities will be a 7.30 a.m. Sunday morning uh, sunrise service. Uh, we are doing a 7.30 at every campus this year because we need to in order to host our community. This is uh, your church, this is your church, uh, but this is also our community. Uh, this is our community to host, our community to, to reach. And so would you consider maybe coming on Saturday? We'll have Saturday services as well. And then we also, as I said, we have Sunday services. Those begin at 7.30 uh, Sunday morning. And actually each campus is gonna do something special at that 7.30 service. So uh, as you make considerations for the service that you're going to attend uh, to worship this Easter, just be mindful of the community that we are hoping to host, that when you give up a seat for one of those prime hours, that that would be an opportunity for someone to maybe hear the gospel for the first time and respond to Christ in a new way. So Easter is coming. But uh, instead of looking forward, I want to look back quickly. And I want to take you back to the year 1999. I know that sounds like a long time ago, uh, where the Jacksonville Jaguars were having an incredible season in the NFL. Uh, they ended the regular season at 14 and 2. They had the number one defense in the NFL for the regular season. Their only two losses had come to their division rivals, the Tennessee Titans. It only lost two games during the regular season. It was time for the playoffs. Because they had done so well, they actually had a bye in the first round of the playoffs. And then they go to the divisional round and they play the Miami Dolphins, who they beat 62 to seven. Then they move on to the next week to the AFC Championship game for the right to go to the Super Bowl only to ma match up with or meet up with their rival, the Tennessee Titans. Uh, in that game, they lost 33 to 14. How do they score 62 points the week before and only score 14 points the week after? How did they average 24 points a game during the regular season, but when they played the Tennessee Titans, they scored 19 points, 14 points, and 14 points uh, respectively? How did they, through the entire regular season, turn the ball over only 10 times, but in the three games that they played the Tennessee Titans, they turned the ball over 13 times? How did they do so poorly against the Tennessee Titans? Well, allegedly, the Tennessee Titans defensive coordinator had a copy of their playbook. You see, it's pretty easy to defend against a team when you know what they're going to run. It's pretty easy to uh, scheme against them when you understand the offensive scheme that's coming against you. Now, I am not advocating for cheating uh, whatsoever, but the good news is, is that we have a playbook that tells us what the offense is going to run against you and me in order to attack you, snare you, trap you, and tempt you. And it would be foolish for us to not look at that playbook and understand the schemes that are coming against us so that we can defend against those and ultimately be victorious in Christ. And that's what we're gonna talk about today, the schemes of the devil. So if you will, open your Bibles to Genesis chapter three, verses one to 13 is where we're gonna be. Genesis chapter three, that's page two if you're opening one of those blue Bibles that's underneath your seat. Uh, we are going to continue our series, Go Back to the Beginning, today, where we're looking at uh, the way that God created and designed uh, His creation for it to function. When we understand and align ourselves to his, cre his design, then that always seems to function a little bit better, because when we're aligned to the designer's intent... Uh, things function a lot uh, better. And so uh, we have introduced, we talked about uh, two weeks ago, our adversary, the devil, and the devil is the one who led an angelic rebellion of which a third of the angels fell. Those were called demons. A third of the angels fell. That was an angelic rebellion against God. And today, Satan tries to lead a human rebellion against 
God. But what we're going to do today is look at those schemes. How does he try to lead that rebellion? How does he scheme against you and against uh, me, because we need to be able to stand against those schemes. In fact, in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 11, Paul admonishes us to put on the whole armor of God so that we may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. And part of the armor of God is the belt of truth. And we need to understand the truth of the schemes of the devil so that we can stand against them and not fall into temptation. So let's read the play that was run way back in the beginning because it's a play that Satan continues to run against you and me. So Genesis chapter three, we're gonna go through one, uh, verse one through 13 and just follow along. I wanna read it as a whole, please. It says, now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, did God actually say you shall not eat of any tree of the garden? And the woman said to the servant, we may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it lest you die. Verse four, but the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was, it was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, well, she took of its fruit and ate. And she also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate. Then the eyes of both were opened and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man and said to him, where are you? And he said, well, I heard the sound of you in the garden. And I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. And he said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? And the man said, well, the woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me the fruit of the tree and I ate. Then the Lord God said to the woman, what is it that you have done? And the woman said, the serpent deceived me and I ate. And we'll stop there for today. May God bless the reading of his word and may our hearts be open to hear from him. Uh, we are going to study the schemes of the devil and we're gonna do it as uh, uh, quickly uh, as we can. And the reason why I want to drill down uh, into this particular scheme is because the schemes of the devil follow a pattern as old as time. The schemes of the devil follow a pattern as old as as time. And so if you understand and can identify what the scheme is, uh, we're going to follow it because it, uh, in, in my brain, it follows kind of a, a downward progression. And if you can identify uh, what the, the scheme is against you or where you are being attacked or where even you are in the midst of that temptation, then it's very helpful for you uh, to get out. Another reason why I want to study this is as we talk about be, being disciples, making disciples, and reaching those who do not know or walk with Jesus, as we meet with folks to help make disciples, uh, sometimes it's, very, it's more helpful if we can help them identify where they may be in the temptation scheme. Because oftentimes, and I'm, I am guilty, when I am sometimes in, in a scheme or, or being schemed against, against the devil, it's harder for me to see. But Jen will go, Cody, don't you see this? Or I'll have a buddy say, don't you see this? Oh yeah. And sometimes it's easier for someone to see on the outside looking in. And so hopefully we can identify these schemes so that we don't fall into temptation. I want to I want to be careful on that too. Uh, uh, ladies and gentlemen, it is not a sin to be tempted. It's not a sin to be tempted. That is what the tempter, the devil, Satan does is tempt you. It's a sin to fall into temptation. Jesus was tempted, yet Hebrews chapter 4 verse 15 tells us explicitly he was without sin. 
He was tempted, but he did not fall into temptation. He did not sin. So we're going to identify these schemes, the downward progression, and I think the applications will be uh, relatively obvious to you. So uh, let's start off with the first step or the first uh, scheme that the the devil runs against you and me, and it's uh, this. It begins in isolation. It begins in isolation. Now, I understand that uh, many of you will say, hold on, Cody. Um, It wasn't just the woman. Adam was there too. And I agree with you. I believe that. It says it there that he was with her in verse 6. But as we look at the conversation that is going on here, it's specific to the individual. It's an individual conversation. And that's why I say it begins in isolation. If you look at the the middle part of verse 3, it says, He, that is Satan, said to the woman, said it to an individual. It begins in isolation. And if I hope that you've heard some of the sermons that we've we've done in the past where we've talked about uh, you need, you were created for real relationships. You were created to be in community. And you physically don't need to be isolated. You need to be amongst the body and and believers in Christ. But just because you're around people does not mean that you're not isolated. Some of you are isolated in plain sight. And that's unfortunate. And and as as odd as this might sound, out of the heaviness of all of the things in this passage, uh, it has been you that I have been praying for the most if you are isolated in plain sight. I've been praying for you uh, this week because you can be in a Bible study, you can be in a small group, you can be in a marriage and not be there. You can be there, but you're not there. You're checked out. You might be sitting in a worship venue right now and your mind and heart are somewhere else. And let me tell you, when your mind and heart go somewhere else, you are, in a sense, mentally isolated from what God is doing. And that's where these temptations and schemes uh, begin. And so don't be isolated, certainly physically. You've got to be a part of the group. But don't be isolated mentally because the schemes of the devil is to pick us off one by one. One. If you read First uh, Peter chapter five verse eight, it says the adversary, our devil, prowls around us looking for someone to devour. It's a singular. Why? Because he's going to isolate us by ourselves, so that then he can take us down. Because we're we're stronger together. We're stronger when we're in the body of Christ with one another. That's why he wants to isolate us. That's why you've got to have people. Even if you're around people, you still have to have people that you're open to and not isolated. Where you're open to uh, mentally, conversationally, accountability, all those things. Uh, I have a handful of men. They can ask me any question. They can check my phone anytime. They can check my computer anytime. That, that is, that I leave that open to them because I need that. You need that. We all need that so that we're not isolated because that's where these conversations with the devil uh, begin. Okay, second. It begins in isolation, but then it begins to entertain discontentment. It begins to entertain discontentment. As that mental battle, the the battlefield of the mind, as that mental battle begins to uh, wage we begin to entertain some discontentment. If you look at the end of verse three, as Satan says to uh, Eve, it says, did God actually say you shall not eat of the tree in the garden? Did did God actually say that that one tree you were not supposed to eat? Certainly if you go back to Genesis chapter two, verses 16 and 17, you see that he in fact did say that, which yes, you need to understand God's word. That should be, if you spent more than one Sunday with us, I hope you know that that is valuable to us. We've got to understand and know God's word. But let's think about that, that particular command that he gives uh, to, to Adam and to Eve there about not eating of that particular tree. I don't know how big the Garden of Eden was, 
but it was bigger than your backyard garden. I mean, I, I don't know if it was the size of Texas, but let me tell you, I know from God's character that he gave them plenty of food to eat. There was plenty for them. So it wasn't about we need food, therefore I had to go to the only tree that had fruit on it. It was the, you know, all the other food out there looks good too, and there's plenty, but yeah, why, why did he say that? We begin to entertain some discontentment, although there's nothing that they needed from that tree. And when we begin to think about discontentment, uh, I want us to, to beware of the ers. Beware of the ers, the ers. And what I mean by that is beware of falling into this, everything has to be bigger Everything has to be better. Beware of those errors because when we begin to entertain, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not saying you shouldn't strive for some of those things. So it's, it's okay to, to want something that's better or whatever, or smaller. I don't, I don't know. Beware of the errors, okay? But sometimes when we begin to go down that path, it's because we're discontent with what God has already provided. And he's already provided enough. And see, the errors fight against enough. And we need to be careful. This is why Paul tells Timothy that godliness with contentment is great gain. It's in 1 Timothy chapter 6. Godliness with contentment is great gain because we go, you know what? I'm not striving for the err always. I'm content with what God has provided, but in the schemes of the devil, we begin to entertain and we begin to mull over those things and ruminate, yeah, maybe I needed something better than what God has provided. So it begins in isolation, it entertains a discontentment, and then it doubts God's goodness. We begin to doubt God's goodness. Again, they had the entire garden to eat from, but they begin to say, but what about that one tree? What about that, that one piece of fruit? And Satan comes in, and in verse 5, he begins to uh, uh, present God's character as something that is less than good. Uh, verse 5, it says, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Now, there's so much in this one particular verse, and I'll try to, to summarize here. But first, Satan is tempting Adam and Eve with the same temptation that befell him. What, what did Satan want? He wanted to be like God. And if you, you need to go back to Jonathan's sermon a couple weeks ago, where uh, know, know Your Enemy, uh, if you want a more in-depth uh, study of Satan. But that was the temptation he fell to. He wanted to be like God. And that temptation still exists for all of us today, where we want to be like God. We don't want to die. Uh, we always want to be worshiped. And we always want to be in charge. Problem is, we don't have the power or control. We, we're also depraved and sinful, which is a huge problem. But we also fall into to the temptation of wanting to be like God as well. Now, here's one of the interesting parts about this temptation. When Satan says to Adam and Eve, you will be like God. Think about this in, in our study of, of Genesis. Weren't they already created in God's image? You do remember that, right? Yes, okay, good. They were already created in the image of God. They were like God in every good way that he wanted them to be like him created with this capacity to know him. The only thing that Satan is offering them that they don't already have from God is that they'll know the difference between good and evil. What a raw deal. The only thing you get out of this is bad. 
but it, they entertain that because it's different. And sometimes we, get, we, we want the, the spice of life that's different, and the only thing that you're going to get is destructive. There's a contrast going on here in Genesis chapter 3 with Genesis 1 and 2 in the way that everything when God spoke came into, into order and was beautiful and was great and was good. Now when Satan speaks, it goes to destruction and death. Beware of entertaining discontentment and doubting God's goodness. Okay? You begin to doubt God. You entertain discontentment. Then you entertain, or then you doubt God's goodness. And oh, by the way, just because God restricts things from you doesn't mean that he's not good. See, what he wants them to think is God is holding out on me. And it's, no, God is not holding out on you. God is holding these bad things back from you. He, he's doing this for your goodness, for, for your protection, for your life. So don't equate restrictions with a lack of God's goodness. Equate restrictions with God's protection, with, with, with what a good heavenly father would do for any of his children, which is how you would treat any of your children. You would, you would hold them back. You would put a boundary between those things that will hurt them and, and, and them personally. That's what God is doing here. So don't Doubt God's goodness. Okay, fourth, after we entertain the, the disobedience, we doubt God's, or entertain discontentment, we doubt God's goodness, we begin to rationalize disobedience. We begin to rationalize disobedience. You are on the wrong path when you begin to think that sin makes sense. When you begin to think that sin makes sense, you're, you're on the wrong path and you're far down the path. This is one of the reasons why I brought up earlier. Sometimes it's easier for someone on the outside to look in and go, hey, Cody, this is not good. You're going down the wrong path because sometimes when we follow this path and we get so far down it in this downward spiral, we begin to go, I think it kind of makes sense, right? No. No, it doesn't. look at verses 6a, the first part of verse 6. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. Now, many people have uh, tried to uh, theorize and pontificate as to what of this particular fruit was oftentimes uh, the, the icon is usually the apple. It might have been a fig because they're covering up themselves with fig leaves. I don't think it was either of those. I think I know what kind of fruit was on that tree, and it was this. <laughs> Beware. Beware. I'm telling you, I, can, I cannot resist. I, I confess. I had some of those last night. And, and here's the problem. Uh, a buddy of mine gave me a party pack. Super dangerous. But I rationalize it every time. Every time I rationalize it, I go, you know what? I'm just going to have a few. Never can I only have a few. I do not know what it is in my brain, but I eat until I'm sick of those things. And I think every time, this time is it gonna be different, and it never is. And I try to then pawn them off onto my boys, like eat more, eat more, which only makes them sick. This does not turn out well, but we begin to rationalize disobedience. And I don't know what it is or, or what sin you are particularly uh, tempted with, but you begin to go, you know, this, does this make sense? You know, this, when she, we talk about what Eve was thinking here and when it describes what she was thinking, it breaks down into some very Monday morning uh, practical ways, meaning the first was that it was practical. We go, everybody's doing this, Cody. This is practical. 
It makes sense. This is a shortcut. Anybody would take this shortcut. It's very practical. That doesn't mean it's biblical. Okay? It's, it was pleasurable. Well, this, this is ple- that fruit looks really good. You know, th- this would bring me a lot of happiness. This would bring me a lot of, of pleasure. Well, it also brought death. And it brought potential, where she says, this would make me wiser. Th- this has potential for the future. If I just do it this one time, then I'll never have to do it again, and it'll all be better. It'll all be better in the future. It, it, you know, if, if I just have a handful now, I won't have another handful in two minutes. No. Nope. I'll go back to it. I keep going back to it, back to it, back to it. Beware when you begin to rationalize disobedience. I understand that from a worldly standpoint, that may, might make sense. That's why you've got to understand biblically what God's word says because he's trying to keep you from those things because oftentimes when we take a shortcut, we end up in the weeds or we end up in the mud. So, so beware of these things. Uh, Doug Cecil has a quote, and I love it. He says, you will never find in sin what you go into sin looking to find. You will never find in sin what you go into sin looking to find. And when we begin to rationalize it, we go, no, I'm going to find it, and then I'll never go back to it. Or then things will turn out well. You're never going to find it. Never going to find it. Okay, so we begin to rationalize that disobedience, trying to tell ourselves that it will make sense. And then fifth, we begin to look for company. We begin to look for company. And the reason why we begin to look for company when we go down that path and begin to fall into temptation is because we look for validation through association. We look for validation through association. If you look at the end of verse 6, and she also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate. So it's like, here, you try some. I just told you I do that with my boys in the nerd clusters, you know? Here, it it makes me feel better if you guys will eat some too. This is another one where from the outside looking in, it's a little bit, sometimes it's a little bit easier to say because one of the markers that are are more obvious to those on the outside looking in is uh, we are going down a wrong path when our Uh, friend groups when our community begins to drastically change. And and when when we start looking for people that will just validate um, the sinful choices that that we're making because we say, "They, they, they love us just for who I am. Sometimes, guys and girls, Sometimes the most unloving thing that someone can do is tolerate you where you are. I, and I say that, I, I really do say that in love. I know that that's a hard thing to hear. But sometimes the most loving thing is accountability, is confrontation, in, in, a, in a loving confrontation way, one-on-one, with a, with a humble heart that knows that we could fall as well. But just getting into a community that affirms everything that we want to believe, that validates all the decisions that we want to make, sometimes is very, very dangerous. Because we go, see, everybody is like me. Well, remember what Jesus says in Matthew chapter 7, wide is the gate that leads to destruction. And many find that. Narrow is the gate that leads to life, and few find it. So let's be careful about the community that we keep and understanding that we, yes, we need to reach the 800,000 in our own backyard who do not know or walk with Jesus. Yes, I'm not saying that you can't be friends with people that aren't believers. I'm not saying any of those things. What I'm saying is where are you getting your wisdom and accountability from? Where, where is that true community where you're not isolated, where you're saying, Here's open heart, here's open mind, speak into my life with, with humility, but also with biblical wisdom. So we begin to look for company. Then we begin to shift blame. We begin to shift blame. 
you look at verses 12 and 13, it says, the man said, the woman whom you gave to be with me, she's the one that gave me the fruit of the tree and I ate. Then the Lord God then looks to the woman. Well, what is it that you've done? And the woman said, well, don't look at me. The serpent deceived me and I ate. Begin to blame shift. And it's not my fault, it's their fault. This is one of the reasons why biblical confession is so important because we're coming before the Lord and going, yeah, I did it. It's me. See, this is where we get the the punchline of the joke, you know, the devil made me do it. The devil didn't make Adam or Eve do anything. Just presented it on a silver platter. And they took and they ate themselves. And here's the most dangerous blame shifting that's going to go on if you are being tempted in this way. And it's not that you begin to to blame someone else for your sin, but what Satan wants to do is he wants you to blame God. God, you're the one that put that tree here. You're the one that put that substance there. You're the one that put that person there. You're the one that put that X, Y, and Z there, that opportunity there. God, it's your fault. That's what Satan wants to tell you. And he wants you to buy in and believe and shift that blame to him. But here's two things that you need to remember. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13 says that whenever we're tempted, that God always provides a way of escape. Always. And second, you need to also remember that God never tempts anyone. That's James chapter 1. God never tempts anyone. He, God is not tempting you. And, and I've heard that before in my past where, where people have tried to, this is rationalizing disobedience here, where people have tried to tell me, Cody, when I'm in the midst of that temptation, it just makes my faith stronger. That is foolish. That, that is foolish to stay in that temptation. That's why I want to outline this scheme for you because it would be foolish to stay in that. It's wise to run away from, to, to flee from sin or temptation so that you don't fall into temptation. So it shifts blame and then finally it ultimately causes division. Causes division. This causes division amongst uh, us as individuals but also between us and God. Verse seven and eight. Then the eyes of both were opened and they knew that they were naked. Now hold on. Were they naked before? Yes. Yeah, the end of chapter two, they were naked, but they were unashamed. The only thing they get out of this deal is shame. That's it. Shame. And because they're ashamed, they sew fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths, covering up their most private, intimate parts. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden and in the cool of the day, and the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord among the trees of the garden. They gain shame and they begin to cover themselves up, not wanting to be known or exposed or anything like that. And we do the same today. They're just proverbial masks that people put on to say, I'm fine. I've got a fig leaf. I'm good. And what God wants is for us to not have shame because we're in Christ. He wants us to relate to him and he wants to, us to relate to one another, which is why the good news in all of this is that the God of all ages has a pattern of pursuing us time and time again. The God of all ages has a pattern of pursuing us time and time again. Don't miss the, the active initiator, rescuer, savior is God himself who comes looking for his own. In verse nine, but the Lord God called to the man and said to him, where are you? There's three questions that God asks in here. Where are you? Who told you? And what did you do? Now let me ask you a rhetorical question. Does God know the answers to all of those questions? Of course he does. So why is he asking them? Because he just wants them to confess and to come clean and say, yeah, I'm sorry. I I did. I believed the lie. I rationalized it 
and I wanted to shift the blame, but you know what? Honestly, I did. Please forgive me. And he jumps in to forgive, always. That's the nature and character of God. That's what we see. Jesus' stated explicit purpose in Luke chapter 19, verse 10, was to seek and to save the lost. That's the whole reason why he came. He just wanted to seek after those that were trying to hide, that were saying, I don't want to be seen. What I got is too bad. What I've done is too bad. And he goes, come on. Where are you? Who told you that? Don't believe them. Don't believe. They don't have your best interest in mind. I promise. Believe me. What did you do? I can restore it. I can redeem it. How? How? It's through sacrifice. It's through sacrifice. And that's what eventually happens here. It's through the shedding of blood, there's forgiveness of sins and sacrifice that is made. And that's what we're going to celebrate together as a Christ Chapel family. Is we're going to take communion together at all of our venues. Because it's only there that we're invited back into fellowship where the Lord made a sacrifice for us. When he paid the penalty for our sins. And it's time for us to confess and to come clean and to stop hiding and to not be in isolation, but to come to the table with our brothers and sisters and come to the table with the Lord. So let me pray for us. Uh, God, we thank you that you make us aware of these schemes so that we don't fall into temptation. But even when we do, Lord, I thank you that you've made a way for us to come back into a right relationship with you, that you tell us, Lord, that that if we will confess our sins, that you are faithful and just. Faithful because you do it time and time again, but also just to forgive us of our sins because you paid the penalty in full, completely sufficient payment for our sins through your son, Jesus Christ's sacrifice. But you're faithful and just to cleanse us from our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Thank you that we get to come to the table with joy. Thank you that we get to come to the table with hope. Thank you that we get to come to the table together. We get to come to the table with you. And it's only through Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. I think that's an incredible message. And as Cody said, we're here to celebrate. And so as we come before the Lord's table with a spirit of worship, because that's what it is, thanking God for what he's done in our lives, I think about Cody's last point in his sermon that God, the God of all ages, has a pattern of pursuing us. Thank God for that. Thank God for that. I'm reminded of what Hebrews chapter 10 says, that he sanctified us through the offering of the body of Christ once and for all. I hope you know what that means, that once and for all. He died for our sins once and for all. How great is that? And even continue saying, Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins. He sat down at the right hand of God. In other words, that was a mic drop right there. It wasn't like the priest who had to continue to sacrifice. Christ did it once and for all for our sins, past, present, and future. It's a great time to celebrate the Lord's communion. Maybe some of you today are still carrying that bag of sins over your shoulders and you just need to hear this message he died for you and when you said yes to him it meant that your past and your present and your future was taken care of on the cross through the work of Christ and we are so thankful for the opportunity so as we come to the Lord's table to get together we remember how he has reconciled us to God because of the work of Christ It is through that work of Christ that he's done on the cross that he's still calling out today to all humanity what he said to Adam and Eve. Where are you? And you have responded saying, here I am. And that gives joy, should give you joy to celebrate. Because he died for our sins on that cross three days later. We know from scripture he was raised from the dead giving us hope of eternal life. 
So as we take these elements to remember that on the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took bread. And as the word of God says, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's take and eat together. In the same way, he also took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let us take it together. Church, let's stand and pray and thank God for what he's done on the cross, allowing us to gather together at the Lord's table, but also should give us expectation that one day, it won't be any of us up here. One day we'll be with him. He'll be doing this with all of us. And so it should give us expectations of what he's done and what we should look forward to. God, we thank you. We come before you. We thank you for what you've done on the cross. We thank you that you continue to pursue us. We thank you for the hope you've given us. Encourage to trust you as you continue to work in our lives. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So I'll run to the fire. 
praise God that he does reign above it all because that affirms that 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13 passage where even when the devil sets all these schemes and traps, he provides a way out. Like it's, it's, those aren't any match uh, for him. And so, uh, man, if you're a guest, thank you so much for choosing to spend a part of your weekend with us. Uh, certainly glad that you chose to do so. These are wonderful folks you're sitting around who want to encourage you in your walk with Christ. And uh, if you want some concrete steps about things you can do to begin to, to meet them, to get more involved, et cetera, please go out to the great room. Uh, you'll see a screen that looks like that and a person that can answer any questions you have and give you some practical next steps. Also, uh, if anyone in here needs prayer for anything, we would love to be able to pray for you. We'll have some folks uh, down front here. Uh, maybe you've never walked with Jesus and you want to know this God that has been pursuing you and there's a stirring in you. Love to be able to talk to you, or maybe you're one of those that you say, yeah, I was here, but I wasn't here. I, I was isolated. Man, let's pray. Or maybe you're under great attack. Would love to pray. There's so many reasons to pray, and thank God his ear is always attentive to our prayers. So uh, you're going to walk out of here, and you have uh, studied his word. You've understood the schemes, and guess what? The attack's going to come tomorrow. The offensive scheme is going to get run on you. So tomorrow, remember, you've got to wake up. You've got to put on the full armor of God so that you can guard against the devil's schemes, okay? Christ Chapel, we love you. We'll see you next week. Bye. I'm glad you were a part today. And I hope you have a great week until we're back together next Sunday as we, again, go back to the beginning to see more of what God has for us. We're still here for a little bit if you'd like to pray with someone from our team before you go today. And you can reach out to me during the week if we can be praying for anything or if you have questions we can help with. We'll see you next Sunday.